I'm Michael Taylor, and today I'm going to be discussing the fraught topic of professionalism in the Army of the Roman Republic. Now, the Republican era army was a citizen militia recruited through mass conscription. Its officers at every echelon, centurions, military tribunes, and generals were elected. But the army was also quite good, vanquishing enemies on three continents, and therefore historians and military officers, the sort of people who value professionalism and belong to well-defined modern professions, often wonder just how professional the army of the Republic was, and if, in the course of its evolution, it became more professional over time. Now, one problem with the professionalism discourse is that definitions of professionalism vary widely. Worse, the notion of professionalism is profoundly morally inflected. I suspect that for both the academic and military personnel in the audience, calling someone unprofessional is a grave accusation, virtually a slur. And we often use the term professional casually as a synonym for good. For the purposes of this presentation, it seems best to simply offer my own working definition, and please feel free to disagree in the discussion afterwards. Now, like Gaul, my definition is divided into three parts. Now, first part, professionals have a high degree of expertise and skill in a given endeavor, the result of significant experience. Part two, professionals are economically dependent on the financial rewards from their endeavor. And part three, professionals are defined as socially distinct from broader society through such mechanisms as training regimes, credentials, legal privileges, professional societies, etc., etc. Now, the first is a proficiency based definition, the second is economic, and the third, and perhaps the most important for us as historians, is social, the professional vis a vis the rest of society. Now, the final destruction of the Roman Republic by Augustus certainly resulted in what today we would describe as a professional military force. From Augustus onwards, Roman recruits, usually volunteers, were required to serve 20-year terms, serving in standing permanent legions. They were rewarded with a large retirement bonus at the completion of the term. The hierarchy of centurions was rationalized, and men moved up a well-defined gradation of centurions by appointment. Soldiers were forbidden to marry, thus severing them from mainstream society. Um, but they also had the ability to make a will while their fathers were still alive, a much envied legal privilege. So looking at my three-point definition, I'm pretty comfortable calling Imperial Roman soldiers professionals. Their long service allowed them to accumulate skills and experience. They derived their income from their military pay, occasional donatives, and the hope of a large retirement bonus. And finally, and most importantly, they were rendered distinct from society due to prominent legal restrictions and privileges. Now let's rewind to the Republican era. At no time did the, in the Republic did Part Three apply. Professionals as socially distinct from broader society. Military service was near universal. Conscripts ping-pong between campaigns and their civilian lives. They could marry and have families, even if it seems that many Roman men delayed marriage until the bulk of their military service was complete. Legions were raised for a campaign and were disbanded afterwards. And soldiers had no special legal privileges, nor did veterans. It is impossible to see Roman soldiers as socially distinct professionals during the Republic. But let us consider the economic definition, relying on the professional endeavor as the dominant source of livelihood. Now, there's no question that throughout the Roman Republic, soldiers often benefited financially from warfare, although Roman military pay was not high. Roman soldiers were paid three asses a day at a time when an ox driver could make five. Now, some soldiers did come back from some wars with a share of loot and a generous donative from their commander although many campaigns were grinding and unremunerative. Now, nonetheless, during the Republic, all Roman soldiers were expected to have another form of income. Namely, they were supposed to be assidui, men who met a minimum, if somewhat arbitrary property requirement, which ensured they had a livelihood outside of military service. Now, the requirement itself was low, a mere 400 denarii in the middle 2nd century BC, and dropping again by the 1st. 
Still, there is currently an optimistic reevaluation of Roman peasant agriculture, especially in the hinterland of Rome, which suggested that even very small peasant farms were engaged in profitable, labor-intensive, heavily, heavily capitalized, and market-oriented farming. Um, they were farming everything from olive oil and wine to dormice and flowers. The one Ugarum farm of the famous centurion Spurius Ligostinus therefore may have in fact been economically viable. Now the standard narrative about the Roman army is that it became more professional in the, in the economic sense when Gaius Marius recruited proletarii, men below the already low minimum standard, minimum property standard, as volunteers for his Numidian campaign in 107 BC. And a very common interpretation is that by the first century, the army was composed almost exclusively of poor men who relied on military service for their income, uh, essentially mercenaries who became more loyal to their commanders than to the res publica. Now, during civil wars, Roman soldiers did appear quite mercenary, although this had as much to do with the general breakdown of, uh, of legitimacy caused by the civil war itself. Now, the proletarian army of the late Republic has recently been strongly doubted by Francois Cadieu. Um, the emergency recruitment of proletarians had been common before Marius, and proletarii had always crewed the navy. There is no evidence that proletarian recruitment ever became the norm. It's important to note that Marius himself discharged his proletarian volunteers after his Numidian campaign, and subsequently assumed command of an army levied in the standard fashion for his next campaign against the Germans. Furthermore, while our sources for the lives of common Roman soldiers are sparse, we do have evidence for Roman men serving short stints in the army and then going on to do something else. For example, Lucius Orbilius Pupillus served as a military clerk and then a cavalryman in the 90s BC before he embarked upon a career as a grammarian. Sorry, grammarian. Um, we also hear of two brothers from Philarii, the Veiani. They served as soldiers in Spain, probably in the 70s BC, but then returned home, inherited their father's small house and one Ugarum plot, installed beehives, and made a handy income selling honey. Thus, while Roman soldiers in the Republic benefited financially from their military service, they still continued to be tied to land holdings, and they also moved on to civilian pursuits. This leaves us with the proficiency-based definition, experience and skill acquired over service. Now, during the Punic and Macedonian Wars, the Romans acquired a massive amount of military experience. From 200 to 167 BC, there were 8 to 13 legions in the field, requiring some 44 to 72,000 men. The result was that military experience and skills were widely distributed throughout the Roman population of roughly 250 to 300,000 adult male citizens. However, this knowledge was sustained entirely by operations, once the operational tempo dropped after 167 BC, the number of legions in the field plummeted, oftentimes no more than three or four. Soldiers served fewer years, and even when they served, they saw less intensive combat. Notably, this was a period when the Roman army routinely failed against less sophisticated enemies, owing to the incompetence of generals and the inexperience of soldiers. The op tempo, however, accelerated dramatically after the social war and after the subsequent civil war between Marius and Sulla, um, uh, also the war against Mithridates and the conquests of Pompey and Caesar. Um, military developments in the first century, uh, excuse me, military deployments in the first century spiked to levels not seen since the Second Punic War. And notably, the quality of leaders and soldiers likewise improved dramatically, as evidenced by Caesar himself. On the whole, however, the army of the Roman Republic was not a professional force. But how could a non-professional army be so good at massive hegemonic deployment? Um, so let me end with a provocation. Professional armies are in fact terrible at massive hegemonic warfare. Now mind you, professional armies are quite good at petite guerre, internal policing, and frontier maintenance. But the fact that professionals, by definition, require mechanisms to make them distinct from broader society inevitably reduces their numbers. Hegemonic warfare is a numbers game, either to overwhelm op opponents, project power across multiple theaters, or endure casualties. And professional forces inevitably fail on the basis of their distinctiveness and exclusivity. Now, professional cadres can be a knowledge strategy for hegemonic warfare. 
one that the U.S. has used for the Civil War and World Wars, in which a small professional class of officers and NCOs acted as a reservoir of competency to train and lead hastily raised armies of volunteers and conscripts. But the Romans eschewed even this. The entire citizen body proved the reserve of military knowledge, allowing the Romans to quickly recover from the destruction of armies and the deaths of numerous generals in the Hannibalic War. It is notable that the transition to a professional force under Augustus led to a new casualty aversion, including the abandonment of Germany after the loss of three legions at Calcrisi, the sort of setback that the Republican militia had absorbed many times over. The army of the Roman Republic was therefore successful, perhaps, precisely because it was unprofessional. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion.